Good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome to you. Uh, we are so grateful, uh, Jedediah and myself, to be able to join you in your homes as we worship God together. And we give thanks for the amazing technology that allows us to do this. And we pray that you will know God's blessing as we worship together. Just an update on Brenda's dad, as many of you have asked. He is going to be discharged from hospital tomorrow, going into a rehab center um, where they'll do some physical rehab for him. And we're hoping that that will go really well and that we'll be able to have him home soon. But we are so grateful for your prayers, for your love and for your support in this challenging time. Our service is going to consider the ongoing theme of Advent. And today we'll be looking at, at Jesus, the bread of life, born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. And as we begin our time to worship together, our call to worship comes from Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Each day proclaim the good news that he saves. Publish his glorious deeds among the nations. Tell everyone about the amazing things that he does. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. Father God Almighty, we come into your presence this morning. You are the great creator, the God who has made the world. And we sing a new song to you. A song that we sing from lips that have woken up this morning with the many blessings that you fill our lives with. From hearts filled again with your mercies that are new every morning. O oh God, we praise you for your goodness for your faithfulness, that you reign, but that you also shepherd, that you are not only our king, but the shepherd who rescues us, who leaves the 99 and comes to find us, that you stepped into our midst, that you showed us your love, and that we can know you and be called your children, sons and daughters of the shepherd king. Lord, we confess to you that you give us so much and yet we so often are selfish and short-sighted that we are greedy and distracted. Forgive us, Lord, for the times that we have hardened our hearts when we have not been grateful for our blessings, where we have not been sensitive to the needs of others where our pride has derailed us and, and we've given in to our temptations. Lord, forgive us. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus, that there is nothing that can separate us from your love, that you went to the cross and on the cross carried our sin, that we might be forgiven. Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. Thank you for your love. Be with us in our service now, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. As we get Good morning, boys and girls. I think you might be wondering why I've got the camera pointing to my feet this morning. That's because I want you to do something to help you imagine what I want to talk to you about this morning. I want you to take your shoes off. There we go. Feel the whatever's between your toes. Maybe it's the carpet or maybe it's the floor at home. I hope you were also wearing sandals or slip-on shoes so it was easy to take them off. So I hope you've got your shoes off right now. <laughs> All right, if you, even if you haven't got your shoes off, imagine the feel of your toes on soft grass. Mm, that's very relaxing. Or imagine the feel of your toes walking on the beach with the sea sand slipping between your toes and around your feet. Mm, that's a lovely feeling, isn't it? All right, or imagine walking on prickly grass. Mm, not so nice. 
I think our Bible character that we're going to start with this morning was probably walking on prickly grass. Can you think who I'm talking about? A Bible character who was told to take off his shoes? Yep, I hope you're thinking of Moses. All right, and if Moses, if you were Moses with your shoes off in the Bible, can you remember what, what you would be looking at? Hmm? It was a burning bush. That's right. And God spoke to Moses from the burning bush saying, Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. Holy ground. All right, now I want you to imagine right now, wiggle your toes again, and imagine you are standing on holy ground. Quite an amazing feeling, isn't it? Quite a thought. All right, Moses was standing in the presence of God. But you know what? You don't have to imagine too hard because this God who at the beginning of this passage said to Moses, do not come any closer. He came closer to us. And that's what we're getting to ready to celebrate at Christmas time. God came close and the ground that we stand on every moment of every day is holy ground. Now in the Christmas story, I like to imagine that maybe the shepherds took their shoes off. The Bible tells us they were terrified. They had such a sense that they were standing on holy ground. Or maybe when they went to go see baby Jesus in the stable at Bethlehem, maybe they took off their shoes. Imagine the straw and the muck between their toes. But they had such a deep sense that they were standing in the presence of Almighty God on holy ground. And so at Christmas time, I want you to remember that we walk on holy ground. We have a God who came near to us and we must never take his holiness for granted. Many of you know that my dad has been sick and I've had a real sense of walking on holy ground these last three or four weeks as we've watched God carry him through this and as he's slowly getting better. It's been holy ground. But every day, every moment is holy ground and let us not take that for granted this Christmas time. Wiggle your toes again and remind yourself you are standing on holy ground because the Lord Jesus came near to us and we can know his love and his glory and that he sets us free. And so walk through this Christmas with a real deep sense of holy ground between your toes and in your heart and in your celebrations this Christmas. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, that you came near to us, that you set us on holy ground in your presence, forgiven and free. And as we celebrate that this Christmas, fill us with deeper joy and wonder than we have ever known before. And let our toes wiggle with the joy of knowing that we stand on holy ground, invited into your presence, because you came near to us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. I really love the Bible. I love the way that it holds together the coherence that it has, that there are themes that are often separated by hundreds of years and different authors and different traditions, and yet it all pulls together. Now Bethlehem is one of those places in the, in the Bible that 
has such significance and is mentioned in so many different contexts. And yet there's a thread that pulls it all together. And Bethlehem's story really starts with Ruth and the story of Elimelech, who, whose name means my God is king, and Bethlehem, which means house of bread. And there's a famine in that part of the land and Bethlehem has no bread. And so Elimelech goes to Moab, a foreign land, where his sons marry foreign wives. And Elimelech dies and his sons die. And the future of Israel looks uncertain. And then Naomi brings her daughter-in-law Ruth back to Bethlehem. And there Ruth catches the eye of Boaz. And after a, a beautiful story of, of romance and, and God's working behind the scenes, Ruth becomes the great-grandmother of David. And her name features in the ancestry and genealogy of Christ. Bethlehem is also the city where David is first crowned as king. And then we get to the book of Micah, the prophecy of Micah. Micah was a prophet who lived towards the end of the 7th century before Christ. And his prophecy alternates between stern criticism of the moral failures of Israel and promises of the restoration that the coming Messiah would bring. The passage that we're going to read not only promises the coming of a Messiah, but even talks about where the Messiah would be born. And it's this prophecy that when the wise men arrive in Judea and they drop in at Herod's court and they say, where was the king born? And Herod at first it doesn't take them too seriously. But when the scribes turn up this prophecy of Micah that Bethlehem would be the birthplace of the Messiah, Herod becomes so worried about the star that is above Bethlehem that he puts out the order that every child under the age of two years, every male child under the age of two years, should be put to death. This prophecy that is recorded some 700 years before the coming of Christ, carries such weight and authority that Herod would do such a horrible and terrible thing. But also that this prophecy would be true is really quite profound. And so let's listen to God's word. Micah 5 verses 2 to 5. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me, one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. And he will be our peace. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you that today we get to read one of those prophecies that stood for 700 years and then were fulfilled. And we recognize, Lord, that you have done wonderful things through your word. It's the lamp to our feet and the light to our paths. And we thank you for it. And now, Lord, as we reflect on this passage, open our hearts and minds. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. There's nothing quite like the smell of freshly break, baked bread, is there? And for us, bread is a luxury. And, and we enjoy it in multiple forms and different kinds of bread, rye bread, milli bread, uh, and, and various kinds of, of styles of baking. But in many parts of the world, bread is a, is a, is a staple foodstuff, something that is life-sustaining and keeps people going. Throughout Scripture, bread is a powerful symbol. It starts the first time when Melchizedek, 
will serve bread and wine to Abraham and bless Abraham, the one who has all the blessings. And the writer to the Hebrews implies that Melchizedek is, is a foreshadowing of Christ. And he comes right back early in Genesis, bringing bread and wine. Then there's bread baked without yeast for the Passover when Moses leads the Exodus. Yeast being a symbol in the Old Testament of, of brokenness and sinfulness. In the New Testament that will have another symbolism. But, but this idea that, that bread sustained the Passover feast as well. And then in the desert, God provides bread in the form of manna and sustains the Israelites on a daily basis. Bread was part of the sacrifices offered in the temple. And when the temple was established, there would always be a freshly baked loaf of bread on the altar of the Lord. Bread is a key to Boaz and Ruth's story. And even the prophecy of the Messiah's betrayer in the Psalms, the, the, the psalmist speaks about the one who dips his bread in the same bowl as me is the one who betrayed me. And this will be a prophecy of what Judas would do to Jesus. If we go to the New Testament, Jesus and bread have so many connotations together. When he resists their temptations and, 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 and the evil one asks him to turn stones into bread, Jesus says, humankind shall not live by bread alone. In the prayer that he teaches his disciples, he says, give us this day our daily bread. When he tells parables of the kingdom, Jesus talks about the kingdom being like yeast in the dough of, of a bread loaf. That, that the kingdom is that active ingredient that, that permeates the whole loaf and changes everything. Later, once he's fed the 5,000 with, you guessed it, bread and fish, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. Then, when he celebrates the Passover meal with his disciples, Jesus will take the bread, break it and say, this is my body, which is for you. And then on the road to Emmaus, two disciples who were convinced that the story was over, that Jesus was dead, would meet a stranger who will walk with them. And when they invite him in and he breaks the bread, they recognize that this is the risen Christ and everything changes. And so bread is a powerful theme in the Old and the New Testament. And some 700 years before the birth of Christ, Micah promises that in the house of Bethlehem, a king will be born. In the house of bread, Bethlehem, a king would be born. Let's pick out just a couple of the salient points of Micah's prophecy. And, and there are six of them. The first is that Bethlehem is David's city, the place where he was first crowned. And, and so it speaks of a line of kings. It speaks of God's continuity. It speaks of God's plan. It speaks of the fact that, that Jesus is the bread of life. And that he is the king of kings. Micah tells us that this king's origins are of old. And that's such an interesting perspective. Because it points firstly to his ancestry. That, that he is from the line of David. And going all the way back to Abraham. But more than that. I think we can recognize that what, what Micah is saying to us is that the one who comes is the one who has always been. And one of the mistakes that we often make at Christmas time is to think that Jesus began in Bethlehem, instead of understanding that Jesus has always been at the Father's side. His becoming 
human began at Bethlehem. But he has always been present, always part of the Trinity, always part of the God family, and always ready to come into our world so that we might know God better. Thirdly, Micah promises that a woman will be in labor and a child will be born. And this is so significant. The king doesn't just appear. The king doesn't just kind of materialize out of thin air. The king is one of us. He is born like one of us. He experiences all of our world, the brokenness, the heartache, the sadness, the pain, all of that the king will experience because he is born to someone who was in labor. In the fourth place, Micah tells us that he will bring his brothers. His brothers will return. When his birth comes, he will. the brothers will return. And, and it's a picture of a scattered Israel being brought back. And remember that Micah prophesies the fall of Jerusalem. He prophesies their time in exile. And he recognizes the scattering of Israel. And yet the coming of the Messiah will bring Israel back together again. And I think it's no accident that Jesus called 12 disciples. Have you ever wondered about that? Why not just 10? It's so much easier. Why 12? Well, 12 disciples for the 12 tribes of Israel, for the number of completeness of God's people. And this number 12 is used throughout Scripture, and especially in the book of Revelation, to be the symbol of all of God's people that the coming of the Messiah will bring us unity and a, a, a pulling together that he will tear down the dividing wall that separates us from one another. And he brings brothers who have been separated through our sin and our brokenness when we've been scattered and alienated from one another, he will bring us back together again. The fifth thing that Micah tells us is that he will stand and shepherd his flock. And I just love the way Micah puts it. He says, he will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach the ends of the earth. Because not only is the coming Messiah a king, the coming Messiah is a shepherd. And Jesus describes this so beautifully in John chapter 10, when he says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. And so when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. And the hired man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me. And I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. And isn't it just profound that... David, the king who was crowned in Bethlehem, would write a song that we now fondly call, The Lord is my shepherd. And in that song, David speaks about how he relates to God or, or how God relates to us as a faithful shepherd. And this promise is fulfilled. So we've had five key points so far. Bethlehem is the city of a king. But this king's origins are of old. That he has an ancestry, but more than that, that he is eternal. This king will be born. He will really come to us. This king will bring his brothers and sisters together. This king will be our shepherd. 
And Micah crowns all of that by saying, and he will be our peace. He will be our peace. And Paul writes so beautifully to the church in Rome. He says, therefore, being justified with God through faith in Christ Jesus, we have peace with God our Father. We have peace with God our Father. Peace with God and peace with one another. All because the shepherd was born and the king went to the cross for us. And he is our peace. At the moment, many of us feel like we're in a world without bread. We eat the spiritual candy and the junk food that gets dished up by pop psychology and, and, and modern new age thoughts and, and ideas. But we're starving spiritually. We're hungry for God. We're hungry for forgiveness. We're hungry for peace. We're hungry for hope. And at this Christmas time, we have a promise. A promise that is grounded in geography. A promise that is is grounded in beautiful, rich imagery. Bethlehem, a little village in Palestine, a village known as the house of bread, a village known for the crowning of a king, a village known for the birth of a child. This village is singled out some 700 years before the events that were prophesied would happen. And in this village, a child is born. The bread of life is born in the house of bread. And he offers us hope. He offers us peace. Because he is the king. And, and he's born in the house of bread. He is a king whose origins are of old. He's eternal. This isn't just something temporary. This is everything that we had ever hoped for. This king is born into our midst. He is God with us. He is Emmanuel, God with us. This king brings us together. He heals our wounds, takes away our divides, gives us the power and the courage to forgive and be forgiven. This king is our shepherd. And this king gives us peace. In the next little while, we'll hear plenty of Christmas carols talking about Bethlehem. Every time you hear the word Bethlehem, just think of what that village's name meant. Beit Lechem, the house of bread. And recognize that in the house of bread was born one who is the bread of life. And when our souls are starving, when we are weak and our energy has run out, he would come to us and say, I am the bread of life. He who eats of me will not hunger. He who believes in me will have life. And it's my prayer that as we prepare our hearts for this Christmas season, for Advent, that we would reach out to him who is the bread of life. That we would say no to the temptations of the world. And that we would say, humankind cannot live by physical bread alone. We need the one who is the bread of life. We need the one who is the word of God. And that we would find our hope and our peace in him. Amen. Thank you.
We respond to God's word in the offering. And while we can't hand around a physical offering bag today, we can still do the most important part of the offering, and that is giving God ourselves. So let us pray together. Dear Father, you have given us everything we have, and we respond to your word and your love today by offering ourselves. We give you our hearts. We give you our time. It is a gift from you and best used serving you. We will serve you with the talents you gave to each of us. We give you our treasure. You are our gracious provider. And we pray that you will use these gifts to grow your kingdom here on earth. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, this morning we give you thanks that you are the God who prepared so meticulously the road of salvation that we see the trail leading all the way through the Old Testament prophecies, a trail that leads to Bethlehem, a trail that leads to Galilee, a trail that leads to Jerusalem and even to the cross. And that you, Lord Jesus, walked that trail so that we could have life. And this morning, Lord, we thank you for the bread that you put in our lives. The physical bread of our blessings and, and our homes and our opportunities. But Lord, even more so, the spiritual bread that you have put in our lives. Thank you for Jesus who is our bread of life. Thank you that he came to the house of bread to be our bread, that we would find life in our relationship with him. And we pray, Lord, that in this Advent season, we would draw closer to Christ, who is the bread of life, and that we would offer this bread to those around us, to a world that is starving, for real food. And I pray that you would give us courage and clarity and grace that we might portray, that we might be one beggar telling another beggar where we found bread. And Father, we pray for our country and our world at this time of pandemic and of a fourth wave. Father, we pray for our doctors and our emergency workers. We pray for our leaders who must make decisions. We pray, Father, for folk who aren't well, undergoing treatment and chemotherapy. Father, we pray for those who are lonely, sad, or struggling at this time. And Lord, we pray for ourselves. Be with us and give us the wisdom that we need. Give us the strength and courage that we need. And help us to turn to you to partake of the bread of life so that we might offer it to others. In Jesus' name, Amen.
been a wonderful privilege to be with you this morning. And I do pray that you have found the message this morning both comforting and helpful. I'm just so amazed that God would plan his coming into our world with such detail and give us prophecies of 700 years and older that show us so clearly that this was his plan all along. Oh, what an amazing gift the story of Christmas is and how thankful we are to God for sending his son into our world, sending his bread to Bethlehem. It's my prayer that we would be beggars showing others where we found bread. It's my prayer that we will shine with the light and the hope of Christ in this week. And so go in the grace and love of God. Go in the peace and, and the grace of Christ. Go in the power of the Spirit. And may we know the presence of Father, Son and Spirit now and forevermore. Amen. Pretoria North, we are celebrating on the 16th Ramatobani tea. And here are the birthdays for Emmanuel and Grace. Today it is Peter's birthday, and tomorrow it is Brandon and Andriana who turns five who t- celebrate their birthdays. On Tuesdays it's Sanawu, and on Thursday, Martin. On Saturday, Mark, Mark, and Christopher celebrate their birthdays. And then for the anniversaries, today it is Claire and Johan who have celebrated six years of marriage. Tomorrow, Diane and Johan are at 41 years. And also at 41, Amy and Boris celebrate their anniversary on Tuesday, together with Ashley and Leonardo, who have been married for seven years. On Wednesday, it's Deline and Mike's anniversary at 43 years. And Sigourney and Clive, who's been married for seven years. And Diane and Mike, who've been married also for 43 years. On Thursday, it's Linda and Frank's anniversary at 21 years, and Marilise and Gerdes celebrate 15 years of marriage. On Friday, it's Timothea and Francois' anniversary, 27 years, Caroline and Andrew, 33 years, and Corinne and Rainier, who've been married for 16 years. Let us pray for these folks. Thank you, Lord, for the people who are celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week. Thank you for walking with them on their journeys and for blessing them and providing for them. We pray for your continued provision and protection and guidance in the year ahead. In Jesus' name, amen.